All right. <clears throat> well, uh, we'll get started now. Um, I see at least four TOC members as Brennan Burns uh, or Brian Grant on the line, on the phone potentially. I will count that as uh, no, star six to unmute in case you're on the phone. Um, so, uh, you know, today's agenda, this is essentially, Taylor, can you go to the agenda? Cool. So, um, you know, this meeting is kind of our first uh, kind of experiment in, um, you know, getting through the backlog of project presentations and proposals that we have and kind of presenting some of these projects to the TOC and, and wider community so we could, um, either you know accept them or, or give them feedback um, on, on, on the project. So we have three presentations today. We have Creo, Brigade, and, and Cubedge, uh, all applying for different levels. Um, we're going to start with the uh, Creo team first. Um, so I will go hand it off to uh, VBATS, Renal, or whoever's um, essentially taken a, the, the lead uh, on, on this one. Sure. Um, we this is Vincent Betts, uh, and and all is here as well. So we might tag team a, a bit. But um, the proposal for Creo, this has been, I guess, an exciting and uh, whatever journey up to this point for for, for Cryo Creo to get um, out of the Kubernetes incubator um, is more of a formalized CNCF project. Um, it, it, we've opened the proposal finally um, a few months ago. Um, and so while uh, Crow has been as the Kubernetes incubator for a long time now, renamed or whatever to Kubernetes SIGs, um, along with CRI, CRI, CTL, or the CRI tools and other stuff like that, um, it's really uh, the part of this proposal to get it in uh, at the, I put it as the incubating level. Um, it's kind of confusing because it's really, this should almost be a graduation from in, an existing incubator. Uh, so I think this is kind of, while there is a little bit of precedent of things coming out of the Kubernetes incubator, um, it's kind of an odd transition because it's already been in a incubator for some time. Um, and used in production by not only companies, but also projects are, are, are around, rallying around it. Uh, it's been in, it's, it's been a 1.0 and stable and tracking with Kubernetes for quite a while. Um, so it, uh, as, as far as container runtimes go, this is a bit more of a pared down container runtime, um, part of just intrinsic infrastructure underneath Kubernetes. Um, it does not purport to make additional use cases and accommodate um, a variety of different um, interfaces and otherwise. It's really a very tailored infra infrastructure to Kubernetes itself. Uh, and with that, you'll see the releases March and Cadence along with Kubernetes. Um, but as far as uh, an active and diverse as far as maintainers uh, and adopters and contributors. It's a very lively project. Um, so it, it's in our in our eyes, it's largely needing to move more from the Kubernetes incubator piece into a sustained project itself to be seen, uh, seen and used accordingly. Um, so I've got a link there to the COC, uh, TOC proposal. It's got a, a bit more information um, on some of the adopters. And I, looking at the attendees list just now, it looks like a few of the adopters are on the call. So if there's questions uh, more broadly, um, that's possible. Um, and yeah, it, it's this, this piece lines up straight down the, the, the mission stack of single purpose, uh, almost Unix philosophy, single purpose, do it well, um, but also support the cloud native infrastructure so that it can run seamlessly into the stack and take away some of the headache of being able to run higher level concepts like Kubernetes and things on top of that. 
Um, so yeah, what I'm not sure if Monaro, if you want to add something, or if Chris, if there's more of a procedure to say what would be next, like questions. Yeah, I mean, you could. Uh, you're <clears throat> you're happy to talk in a little bit about the architecture. Um, I mean, uh, it's really pretty. <laughs> Yeah, if we move on to the next slide, I have added an architecture diagram. So this, I, I can briefly talk to this. Yeah. So this is a view of the node uh, with Cryo as a runtime. You have the kubelet on the left, talking gRPC CRI API to Cryo on the right. And uh, for implementing the two services, we have uh, these libraries called containers image and container storage. Now, containers image is uh, something which is specialized in moving images ac across different registries and formats. So we do a lot of innovation there, like add different backends like NFS and potentially we're also working on BitTorrent and so on. And <clears throat> we use it in other tooling as well, again, like going with the Unix philosophy. So that library innovates at its own pace. And then as we get more features there, we add those features, bubble them up into Cryo. And right now it's the one that is implementing the image service uh, and <clears throat> it's used to pull the images down onto the node. And for the runtime service, like Cryo, the O in the name stands for OCI. So any OCI compatible runtime can be plugged in over there. So by default, we use RunC, but we've been working with uh, Intel from the beginning and we added support from Kata through annotations and eventually that led to adding support for a first class support for runtime class in the in the kubelet api i mean so we are kind of able to innovate at the lower level through annotations and adding new features and then push through them and get them added to kubernetes uh, then another thing is uh, for networking we use cni so any cni compatible plugin can just be plugged in it should just work without any issues and at the bottom, you see the container storage library. So that's where we have drivers for uh, overlay, device mapper. And recently, we are working on a new LVM driver, which takes away pain from device mapper. And it's very important for the VM-based container uh, runtimes. Uh, Sam, uh, do you want to add anything about the Kata integration? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm Samuel. I'm from the, uh, the Kata Continuous Project, and uh, as Manuel was saying, we uh, we started to to work with uh, with Cryo from very early on, uh, before be even before uh, CRI Continuity was was a project. So we, <clears throat> I mean, it, this having Cryo um, uh, following the uh, the community's release cadence and really making sure that the cryo works uh, nicely with the with all the community's version and nothing else um, really helped us uh, start playing with the uh, with virtual machine as an isolation layer for kubernetes uh, this was really our vehicle into into kubernetes and that as as, as Munal was saying that really led to the uh, uh, current runtime class work that's being done uh, at the sig node um, and yeah, this this was a, a really nice enabling vehicle for uh, uh, for Kata containers, and in a more uh, general way uh, for really integrating um, virtual machine into Kubernetes as a first class citizen, and being able to to expand the uh, the notion of runtime to uh, to a much more uh, generic uh, concept. Thanks, Sam, and I think uh, Dan Walsh can talk more about like what we are doing in the containers libraries. Mm -hmm. There's something I missed. Uh, <clears throat> Dan's, Dan's potentially muted, but. Um, okay, okay, all right. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, you're happy to speak more, like we could open up to questions. Um, you know, I, I linked the dev stats out there to um, essentially show some statistics about uh, you know, Creo in, in kind of real time, but uh, as I understand it, you're requesting uh, a proposal for essentially a TOC member to sponsor a, a vote for for incubation, as, as I understand it, correct? Yes, yeah, I mean, so like, like as Vincent said, right, we've been used in production for a while and we got out of one incubator, yeah. but we had to follow the process uh, and I think we would want to get in as the 
highest level possible sort of here. So, sounds 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 good. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll we'll open it up to to questions and make sure we have time for um, other 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 projects. I think there was a question from Dims in the chat about uh, uh, moving off some uh, Kubernetes related um, dependencies. I'm not sure what depend. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to figure that out. Like, is okay. it uh, is the concern that we are importing any paths from Kubernetes itself? Right. Uh, there's a, hi. This is Dims. Uh, so the question is, um, you, you mentioned that you're tied to the hip, uh, to the Kubernetes releases, right? So is there, is, is there a possibility to break that, uh, link, uh, or is it even feasible to break that link? Uh, so the, one of the reasons for asking this question is, uh, we, we are talking about, um, uh, in the SIG node, we were talking about how do we get off of the um, dependency, dependency that we have on Docker uh, in Kubelet that's baked into Kubelet. So this discussion here might help that also. That's why I'm asking that question. So, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. No. Yeah, so I mean, like we are using the CRI API and the issue with Docker uh, was like Docker code has been has been contributed, uh, I mean, the Docker integration code has been contributed to the Kubernetes repo itself. And it was the one that um, the project started with. And so it, there might be some assumptions there and some tight coupling, which makes it hard uh, to decouple. But in case of the new CRI based runtimes, we are just, we are just talking over the socket. So it's, it's not tightly coupled to Kubernetes. I mean, it right. uh, exists in its own repo from the beginning. So while so while it does import some of the paths, it's really importing the gRPC right. APIs and structures, but it's already talking through the decoupled abstraction. Okay, then would it then would it make sense to uh, get those dependencies out into a staging repository uh, in KK, which will help you later? Uh, uh, what do you you mean moving the gRPC stuff out to somewhere yes. else? Yes. Uh, that's that's neither here nor there. I mean, it, if if it's moved into a Kubernetes PKG or you know whatever Kubernetes CRI API that is a submodule that Kubernetes imports and Cryo imports and Container D imports, that's that's uh, after the after the fact. Uh, that the, the the important thing just is really it's not it the the attached at the hip that you reference is uh, part of why the CRI was invented and the CRI that Kubernetes exports is already the decoupled implementation of that. So any further work to, to fully purge any Docker assumptions from Kubernetes itself uh, should already be buffered up to the, the CRI la layer that is where Cryo imports from. So where that lives is neither here nor there. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we have time for maybe one or one one more question. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll move on to the next um, presentation. All right, um, we'll send an email uh, afterwards. You know, with uh, this presentation and um, get some feedback from the community via the mailing list and see if there's any TOC. Member, members interested in pushing this for a vote, okay? So up next, we have Brigade um, that is interested in, in the sandbox and have uh, issued, a, I think, a proposal uh, this morning and they're gonna present today. So I think Michelle is on the line. Hey, uh, Chris, do you mind if I share my screen? Uh, yeah, I think Taylor will have to stop. So we'll, we'll switch. You should okay. be good to go. Thank you. All right. Um, is everyone good with this? Yeah, I, I see. I see you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for giving us time here today to present Brigade. I'm Michelle Norley, and presenting with me is Radu Matai. Um, if anybody has anything in chat, I'll check it at the end. 
Um, so Brigade is, enables event-driven scripting for Kubernetes. It's a lightweight framework built with Kubernetes native objects. Um, essentially, it's an in-cluster runtime that interprets and executes scripts so that users can chain together containers to create high-level workflows using Kubernetes. Um, so every project in Brigade create, uh, it contains this brigade.js file, um, which defines some uh, JavaScript that ends up running on <coughs> that trigger. Um, so as you can see, um, this is uh, here we're defining like a job and that job contains exactly one task and so its task is to run the test on a github push event and this is a simple example but you can actually create multiple tests or tasks inside of a single job and you can define multiple jobs inside of a single script and because this is javascript you can use promise objects to can chain two uh, jobs together to run one after another, or you can run them in parallel. Um, and you can even use uh, things like try catch blocks to uh, deal with error handling. So in just a few lines, um, these scripts uh, become incredibly powerful and robust. Uh, we chose JavaScript because it already has a rich ecosystem of tools. It's also the number one scripting language on the, or was the number one scripting language at the time on the Red Monk ranking and the Tyobi index. And you can leverage any existing JavaScript package in the Brigade script that you write. We often refer to Brigade as Unix shell scripting, um, but for Kubernetes. And so a Unix shell script defines the workflow around executing one or more lower level system executables. Similarly, a Brigade script defines a workflow for executing multiple containers within a cluster. I'm gonna hand it off to my um, colleague, Radu, to explain the high level architecture. Radu, take it away. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, Brigade has a couple of components. First of all, it has gateways, which are components that translate events from either inside or outside the cluster into Brigade events, which are caught by a Kubernetes controller, which listens for these events and creates worker pods. And then a worker pod is scheduled as a result of an event <laughs> in the, the JavaScript defined in your project and schedules the job that you define there together with any error handling and other Kubernetes uh, related operations such as volume mounting, caches and other things. Optionally, you can also have an API that you can use it to interact with Brigade from web dashboards or CLI components or terminals. Awesome. Um, next slide, uh, Radu. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, go ahead. Okay. So uh, there are several different use cases uh, for a brigade. Um, CI/CD is like the first uh, and easiest use case that like comes to mind. But we've been really pleased to see lots of different uh, brigade being used in lots of different ways. Um, for example, one company uses Brigade to do a bunch of meta testing on various code bases at regular intervals. So they'll run language specific linters, um, uh, do code quality assessments and some security scanning, and then they'll notify automatically the right teams uh, if they like find something that needs to be looked at. Uh, another company uses Brigade to uh, build weekly roll-up reports by aggregating and analyzing data from lots of different data sources. Uh, another company uses Brigade to process image data. And um, the last one that I have listed here is something that like the whole team has been so excited to see. Uh, there's uh, one group of people who are using Brigade to spin up preview environments for every pull request or on demand, um, giving developers this like uh, up to date environment to do experiment experimentation and testing on. There's a blog post that I linked in the proposal that's like really interesting, um, this, this use case. So if you wanna learn more about it, uh, feel free to check out the pull request. Um, we've also seen several different projects being built around Brigade. Um, so we have a related project section in the repo and it lists a bunch of um, 
a bunch of projects. Uh, there is someone from Charter, for example, who built the gateways for Bitbucket and GitLab. Kashti is a dashboard that was built alongside Brigade Core um, to view your Brigade pipelines, and there's just several others that you can check out. Um, Redu, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the roadmap and progress? Uh, sure. So we're very close to releasing a 1.0. We hope that somewhere around this week we'll be able to tag 1.0. Uh, together with the 1.0, working towards 1.0, we've been having regular weekly community meetings uh, that, and we just regularly discuss with the community in the Brigade Kubernetes uh, Slack channel. We have a project board that's up to date and we're tracking uh, work items and as well we have the entire CI for Brigade built with Brigade and we're dog putting the latest release every time. As for the roadmap from now till somewhere around May, we, we plan for a stability period for non and non-breaking changes for the Brigade core. At the same time, we want to split out the, uh, the rep repo and have separate repos and release cycles for the uh, gateways and other projects that are in the, in the repo. At the same time, we want to migrate uh, all the projects to uh, Brigade core GitHub organization together with multiple community projects. Awesome, thank you. Um, and do you want to talk to us a little bit about what we're doing within the cloud native community? Uh, sure. So uh, we've, we've been really happy to see lots of uh, integrations coming from the community. So for example, we have a metric exporter for Prometheus coming from the community. We have gateways for Kubernetes in cluster events. We also have integrations with cloud events, which is a CNCF project for defining event schemas. And we actually ship a cloud events gateway with Brigade uh, that, that can handle cloud events uh, schemas. And also with Virtual Kubelet, which is also a CNCF project that allows us to schedule Brigade jobs on top of virtual nodes so that you don't have to provision infrastructure for your builds. As you can imagine, this can, uh, this can spin up endless scenarios where you can have serverless uh, pipelines built on top of Brigade and Virtual Kubelet. Um, thank you, Freddie. Uh, <clears throat> so our last slide is about YCNCF. Um, we think that this is going to be a really great home for us uh, in terms of having a vendor neutral IP space to foster con collaboration. Um, we've seen a number of end user companies um, uh, become interested in Brigade and we really hope to get time with the end user community in the CNCF uh, at large to get some feedback um, and just uh, present what we have and see if they have um, any, any additions or anything for us to, to look at. Uh, we're already leveraging existing cloud native projects, um, like Freddie mentioned, uh, with the integrations with um, cloud events and virtual kubelet. Uh, it's Kubernetes native, it runs in Kubernetes, it uses um, home charts for packaging and deployment. Uh, so we have uh, kind of, we're already really set up with uh, the cloud native space and we want to continue um, to talk about interoperability with other cloud native projects and integrations and um, getting that feedback from this community. Uh, so I'll hand it back over to Taylor at this time and I'm happy to take questions. <coughs> Yeah, let's let's do some um, questions. There's a proposal that I linked um, on on GitHub with uh, Bread and Burns and Quinton as the TOC sponsors for for the sandbox. But we'd love to kind of hear any questions from the community now. I have no questions. I think this looks like a great project to have in the CNCF. Thanks so much, Alexis. A question from Matt Spencer: Would Brigade help with cross-platform CI? Uh, I think I think I can take this one. So, uh, if um, are you specifically referring to Windows and Linux and other operating systems? If if that's the case, then uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking about cross OS. This is cross architecture. So, I mean, I'm, I'm representing ARM here on this call. Um, we're trying to work out how we get different architectures represented in, in the CNCF CI process? Uh, so specifically, we've been working with the community for the last month or so in adding ARM support for Brigade, which essentially means that as long as you're able to join an ARM node to your Kubernetes cluster, then yes, you can run jobs, you can run Brigade jobs on top of that node. And there's, there's options when running the Brigade script where you can pinpoint to a specific subset of nodes or things when running, when defining the job. So yes, it could, 
it could help with that. Awesome, thank you. Hello, hi. Hello. Hi, so the question about the event models, are you folks uh, supporting complex event models such as, you know, one to many and, you know, the, or is that like a pretty simplistic, uh, you know, uh, stringing, uh, uh, sort of running, uh, you know, uh, job sequentially? Do, are you, do you have plans to support that as well? So at, at this point, uh, one brigade project can respond to one event. That being said, when, when, when the event is handled, you can spin off multiple jobs and you can chain them however you want. You can run them sequentially, you can run them in parallel. Uh, you, can, you can have, essentially the, the JavaScript API is flexible enough to allow you to spin up jobs in, in any way you like. Well, I think my question was, can I do like in typical, you know, the, the flow, you know, the uh, process management, I remember we used to have uh, people stuff. So you can do uh, folks and joins and those kind of things. Do you have plans to do those kind of things? Complex, uh, you know, event patterns? Uh, right now we don't have support for that, but I'd be extremely excited to hear the, your use case and then work with that. Great. Okay. Thanks. Hello. Um... My name is Vlad from Tredap. I uh, have one question. Uh, do you plan to extend the uh, features of the uh, DSL itself? Uh, I mean that currently in one job you can create only one container. Uh, for example, in Jenkins you can create multiple and interact uh, with different containers within the same job. Uh, will you plan to, to extend the DSL that way? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually have a proposal for allowing sidecars in brigade jobs in, in the pod. Uh, we decided to leave this out of 1.0 mainly because of the life cycle and pod lifetime implication that would have. And we're, we're actively working with the community to understand what would be the best default for the lifetime of the pod in that scenario. But yes, we will definitely want to support sidecars and multiple containers in pods. Okay, thank you. Cool. All right, any other, one more question? Otherwise we will move on to the next one. There's a proposal I linked that has two TOC sponsors um, already. I think we'll leave it open probably for another day or two to get a little bit um, more feedback uh, from the community before otherwise it's already met the fairly minimum requirements we have for, for the sandbox. So um, I will uh, now uh, close it off and hand it off to the next uh, speaker. So thank you, <clears throat> Michelle and, and Radu for, uh, for your time. All right, now we have, um, I think it's the CubeEdge folks. So I um, believe it is, who is here from CubeEdge? Yeah, Cindy and Sunil should be here. Cool, star six if you have to unmute, but. We'll go for it. Hello, uh, this is Cindy Jing. Uh, today, uh, Sanil Kumar and I are going to present Kubeh project. Currently, Kubeh uh, has contributors from industry, academy, and etc. Uh, we are very excited to have Brandon and Quentin to be our TOC sponsors. We can move to the next slide. Kubeh is a Kubernetes extended infrastructure for IoT and edge computing. With the, uh, the control plane at cloud, worker nodes at edge, Kubeh enables orchestration of uh, native container applications from cloud to edge. It has been proven to be valuable to real customers. The uniqueness of Kubeh lies in the following. Uh, first of all, uh, the edge and cloud are loosely coupled, where the edge side can autonomously work in and in sync with the cloud. Kubeh supports bidirectional multiplexed network communication between cloud and edge. The agent running on the edge side consumes about 10 megabyte memory at runtime. The architecture is based on Kubernetes, is highly extensible and pluggable. One basically run a Kubernetes cluster, cluster from the cloud, 
without knowing where the edge node is located. Next slide, please. Before we drill down to the Kube Edge architecture, I'd like to let us to walk through some of the edge computing use, use cases. On this page, you can see two pictures which are re very relevant to our daily lives. Think about oftentimes we have to, when they go into a parking lot, you have to manually scan something, or you have to wait longer enough time to find a, a, a lot available in the gas station. Imagine using AI at edge, a lot of things can be more efficient and automatic. So through uh, image recognition, uh, AI model at edge, everything can be done easily. Next slide. This use case is about a water tank system. As you can see, there are three water tanks geolocated at different locations. On each water tank, there are sensors, valves, controllers, and through the communication uh, between, among all the controllers, the water level in it, each tank and the pipeline can be stabilized and balanced. So it is a decentralized architecture without the edge node talking to the cloud. So we can uh, move to the next slide. As you can see, and similar edge computing uh, use cases, here is our view of edge computing. The resources and devices are located on edge, but they are managed from the cloud. Applications or serverless functions, they run at edge, but we want to deploy or orchestrate from the cloud. As you can see, essentially edge is an extension of a cloud. We want to have the bi-directional network communication between edge and cloud but the, com the network com uh, connection between edge and cloud can, may not be reliable, and then the cloud-side network bandwidth can be limited. Think about the edge nodes can be large-scale as well. Based on that, we want the edge node can have some autonomy, so business can run on the edge side local, quick, and reliable, and then uh, plus, the edge nodes can be decentralized so that they can be aware of each other, communicate with each other. The other thing is about the heterogeneous uh, uh, uniqueness of the edge nodes. From hardware perspective, it can be a Raspberry Pi or a server machine. And then uh, it also, like from the IoT device to the edge side, the protocols in between can be very diversified and the scale of the IoT devices can be quite different as well. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the architecture. It has two parts. One part is the control plane, which is deployed on the cloud. The second part is the edge agent, which is a single process run on, the edge, run on each edge node. So there are some main components. Let's talk about the edge, edge node side. As I mentioned, there is a single process. The edge D is basically a very lightweight of kubelet for the IoT edge computing. And then the edge hub and cloud hub, they use WebSocket to build the bidirectional com network communication through the same, the single long connection uh, the data, all kinds of data can be communicated. And then the edge controller basically is a Kubernetes extended controller. It converts all the pods, uh, all the relevant pod node information and convert it so that only uh, the targeted uh, metadata will be communicated to a specific edge, part, edge node. And then you can see there are two data storage, ETCD on the cloud for the control plane. We also have another data store at the edge side. Each side maintains the metadata, but on the cloud is for the whole cluster. On the edge side is only the metadata targeted for this edge node. 
Currently, we use SQLite for the data store on the, on the edge side to fit the Raspberry Pi resource constraint. But uh, people feel free, they can pick any other SQL, any other data storage that they would like to have. One thing I want to call out in the edge side, uh, we use the infra uh, framework so that the components are pluggable. For example, if you are not doing IoT scenarios, then at the runtime, when we launch the single process, uh, you can configure without loading the device to an MQTT broker, broker etc. So this is the high-level architecture, and then we can move on to the next. Up till now, we have two minor release, uh, minor version release. Currently, Kube Edge is having an end-to-end -end solution for IoT and edge computing. It builds a fundamental infrastructure based on Kubernetes. In a major release, on top of the, all the current capabilities, we plan to build some uh, data plane service mesh, uh, security guard by integrating with Beefy and uh, Spare, we are also building the device management API using Kubernetes CRD. Uh, we plan also we, pl we also plan to evaluate the performance and scalability. And later on, we have plans to enable monitoring and some other features. Next, please. From a CNCF and community perspective, we really uh, agree with the CNCF vision and would like to contribute to the community. As you can see, Kubeedge is based on Kubernetes. The architecture is very open and uh, extensible. It supports native container application. Um, we presented Kubeedge uh, three times uh, deep session, through deep sessions in KubeCon. While I was presenting, I heard a lot of interest uh, from companies, academy, and folks. And, and uh, so there are a lot of needs. Uh, people are working on IoT and edge computing, which Kube Edge architecture can help people in the world. Uh, and also Kube Edge can help people to integrate with a lot of other CNCF projects. For example, you still Spiffy, Prometheus, and etc. Uh, we like to welcome and engage more people to make more innovations. Another thing, another thing I want to mention is Kubeedge architecture is called out as an example in the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group white paper. So in summary, we think Kubeedge aligned with the community, community. There is the needs. Uh, the architecture is open, extensible, and that we can include more people in the community and build some innovation for the edge computing. And that's what I have. Uh, any questions, comments? No. Cindy, could you perhaps uh, talk a little more about the uh, how how the connectivity between the edge and the cloud is handled, uh, particularly that connectivity is, is often very poor, uh, which is something yes. that Kubernetes does not handle. Could you just explain a little in more detail about how that is dealt with? Sure. So can we go to the architecture chart? So um, from the edge node to the cloud, there is a long connection, which is a single connection. We use WebSocket so that the, the, the connection can be built, but it's initiated from the client, from the edge node, uh, because when we configure or provision the edge node, it knows where the Kubernetes control plane API server is located. Once the connection is initiated, this WebSocket is a bi-directional connection, and then the data can be flowed from uh, and to between the edge and cloud. And the one specialty of Kube Edge, as I mentioned, we handle the network disconnection and reconnection scenarios. 
in case the network disconnected, because on the edge side, we have a copy of the metadata uh, for the edge node, then things can continue, uh, continue uh, and autonomously working without, even without this connection. But once the network connection is rebuilt, then all the data from the edge side can flow back to the, edge of, to the cloud or vice versa. I think you might wonder, like, you know, in the current Kubernetes uh, architecture, every 10 seconds, the Kubelet has to report the heartbeat to uh, control plane about its liveness. But we, how we address this is uh, we use the taint mechanism. So in case uh, the network is disconnected, the edge node will be tainted accordingly so that new deployment won't be uh, scheduled to that edge node. But uh, once it's connected, it can remove the taint and things can continue working. That's what I mean by the edge node and cloud are loosely coupled so that edge side can autonomous, autonomous, autonomously working. And also when the network is reconnected, it just, everything just work like you run a Kubernetes cluster, but the location of the edge node is transparent to the user. Cool, Th thank you. Mm -hmm. any, <clears throat> any other questions, Cindy? Yeah. Uh, imagine the edge, the agent uh, currently is running only 10 megabytes. Uh, as you can see, I think uh, Dean mentioned we are removing the dependency of Docker. I believe currently Kubelet is more than 100 meg or something. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a great uh, improvement we've done. Cool. If there's um, no other questions, um, we'll look forward to a proposal and uh, maybe get some feedback um, via there. Thank you. All right. Um, that pretty much wraps it up for uh, today. So this is a bit of an experiment for us and we're gonna continue uh, doing project presentations um, once a month on the second Tuesday uh, of the month at 8 a.m. Pacific. So hopefully this was kind of useful for folks, um, it's helping us kind of get through the backlog and you know uh, learn about some of these projects that are interested in joining uh, CNCF. So other than that, um, you know, look forward to the discussion. There's some proposals already out there. Um, feel free to give them some comments and then we'll uh, do this again uh, next month. So thank you very much. Cool. Take care all. Cheers. Goodbye. Thanks, Chris. Yep.